I'm going to show you how I use this telescope system to take pictures of deep space like this and this. Hey, it's Ian. I've gotten a lot of people asking me to give them a tour of the telescope system that I use to take photos of deep space. And in particular, to talk about what each component of the telescope system does. Now, there's a lot of pieces of equipment that go into an entire telescope system. When people think of a telescope, they just think the tube, the optics. But there are so many more pieces that go into the system that I think people really aren't aware of, and I think this will help people understand all of the things and all of the pieces that go into this big puzzle known as astrophotography. So let's dive right into it. First, let's start with the telescope. It's what everybody asks about. What kind of telescope are you using? What's the telescope you shoot with? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's the Borg 107 refractor. Now to 99.99% .99 of people on planet Earth, that means absolutely nothing and gives you no information about what it is. So I'll dive into it. So this Borg refractor has a 107 millimeter aperture. So the front lens is 107 millimeters in diameter. For you photography buffs out there, you can compare this to a long focal length lens. Now the lens focal length is 417 millimeters and it's an f3.9. So pretty fast for that focal length. What makes this different from, say, a photography lens is it only has a couple of elements inside of it. And what that means is it only has a few lenses built into it compared to most photography lenses that have like 17, 18, 19, 20 different lenses that are built inside of it. And what that helps with is it allows more light to pass through. Every time light hits a surface, some of that is reflected off. So if you have 19 or 20 surfaces for light to hit, you're losing a lot of light. A lot of that stuff's just bouncing off and you get light loss. Another beautiful thing about this telescope is it supports all different types of camera sensor sizes. So you can use anything from your standard Sony or Canon camera all the way up to medium format cameras like a GFX from Fujifilm. This telescope is made for shooting deep space. You're not putting an eyepiece on it. You're not putting your eye up and looking through it. You're photographing with it. Did I say that I love this scope? Because I do. It's one of my favorite telescopes that I've ever owned. I've owned a lot of telescopes and man, this thing just produces bangers. Is it a banger? Bangers. This next piece of equipment I'm gonna talk about is the absolute most important piece of equipment in any astrophotography arsenal. Some people say it's the camera. Some people are gonna say it's the telescope. Nah. This is the most important piece of equipment. It's called the mount, also known as the star tracker. The stars move across the night sky throughout the night, and we have to follow them. Why do we have to follow them? Because when we take these photos of deep space, we're doing long exposures to capture that light. Now, if you're familiar with photography, a long exposure could be something like two seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. But when it comes to deep space astrophotography, those are rookie numbers. Sometimes we're doing upwards of 10 minutes or more for these exposures. And so now we have to take those 10 minute exposures and track the stars as they move across the night sky throughout those exposures that we're taking. And again, if you've done photography and you've taken a 15 second exposure, you know the slightest bit of wind or movement will shake the camera throughout that exposure and ruin the whole shot. Now imagine you have to do these long exposures while tracking the stars as they're moving and make sure everything is stable and not moving. That's what these star trackers can do. And that's why they're so important. The one that I use is called the Ioptron CEM70G. And what makes this particular mount so special is that it can carry up to 70 pounds of equipment while still tracking precisely. Now I mentioned that we take long exposures, somewhere like 10 minutes or more for these deep space astrophotos, but why do we do that? It's because the stuff that we're imaging out in deep space is extremely faint, it's extremely dim, and that's why light pollution is so bad when you're doing astrophotography. That's why a lot of astrophotographers have to get out to those dark sky locations, is because when they take these long exposures of five or 10 minutes, if you're surrounded by lights, that's gonna wash out your images. But if you're in those dark sites, there's no light pollution to ruin the exposure. You're able to do those long exposures and let in all of that faint light to reveal all of the little details. And the way that we can get even more detail is to take multiple of these 10 minute exposures and then stack them all together to create a single image. 
Speaking of long exposures, let's talk about the camera. So the camera that I use is called the ZWO ASI 2600 Pro Monochrome Cooled Camera. Whew, man, that was a mouthful. It's a lot of words, but that's the camera that I use. Now, when you first look at this thing, you wouldn't think that it's a camera. It doesn't look like your traditional DSLR camera like a Sony or an Icon, but this is indeed a camera, a deep space camera. So what makes it different from, let's say, a Fujifilm camera or a Sony camera? Well, this has a built-in cooling system. When we take those long 5-10 minute plus exposures, we're building up a lot of heat on that sensor, and that heat turns into noise. And so what the cooler does is reduce the amount of noise coming from those long exposures. Now in the super long title of the name of the camera that I gave you, I did mention that it was a monochrome camera. This is a black and white camera. Black and white? Monochrome? Why would you shoot black and white? Why not shoot color? And also, how do you get color images if you're shooting in black and white? Well, first, a monochrome camera lets in more light, so you can get more signal, which essentially just means you can get better detail. But really, most people do want to know, like, how do you get those color images if you're shooting with a black and white camera? And to talk about that, we just have to dive a little bit into camera sensors and how they're built. Color cameras like a DSLR or your cell phone camera actually have monochrome sensors. The difference between the deep space camera that I have and your cell phone camera is that your cell phone camera has a color filter pre-built on top of that monochrome sensor. And that filter has red, green, blue filters on there. And so that's how you get your color images is the color filters already laid on top. Whereas the deep space camera that I use, I select which particular filter I want to use at any given time. And so the way that I select these filters is I use what's called a filter wheel. It's a ZWO7 position filter wheel. All of these filters are made by a company called Chroma. I do have red, green, and blue filters. I also have what's called a luminance filter for you astro people out there. And then I also use narrow band. The narrow band filters that I use from Chroma are a five nanometer hydrogen alpha filter, a three nanometer oxygen three filter, and a three nanometer sulfur two filter. All of that is just technical mumbo jumbo for my astro folks out there. If you don't know what that is, essentially it's what wavelengths of light am I shooting and how much around that wavelength of light am I letting in. And these filters, hydrogen and oxygen and things like that, are chosen because the universe is filled with a lot of objects that emit those wavelengths of light. As a matter of fact, the Hubble telescope uses those particular wavelength filters, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur, to create a lot of the images that we've seen taken with the Hubble telescope. Now, the question always comes up, and I want to address it real quick, is are the colors real? The simple answer is it depends. <laughs> If I'm shooting deep space with my red, green, and blue filters, then yes, the colors that you see are going to be pretty accurate representations of the color that that thing I'm shooting is emitting. Now, if I'm using those particular narrowband filters, then no, those colors are not entirely accurate. And the reason is because the data that's coming in when I'm shooting with narrowband filters is assigned to a color. So I might assign my hydrogen data to the green color and I might assign the images I took with my oxygen filter to the blue channel. Sulfur, I'll assign it to red, and I'll get a nice pretty picture. Now the colors are not accurate, but the details, the details that you're seeing in those images are accurate. And what this allows us to do is see what the different regions of that object we're shooting is made of. So if I see a lot of red in an image, and I said that, well, sulfur is red, then I know any of the red areas in the image are going to be rich in sulfur emissions. Okay, now with that out of the way, let's move on. Let's talk about the guiding system, also known as the guider. You see, not all tracking mounts are made equal. Multiple factors, including even the tiniest imperfections in the manufacturing process, can create a compounding effect that affects how accurate your tracking is throughout the night. How do we get around that? We use the guider. And what the guider does is it guides the tracking. The guider comes in two parts. The guide scope that I use is called the QHY Mini Guide Scope. It's actually a 30 millimeter diameter telescope and it's got a 130 millimeter focal length. And then I have a camera that's attached to that. And that's the ZWO ASI 290 monochrome camera. So how does this guide system actually work? 
what it does is it puts a star on a crosshair and it looks and monitors that star. And if it sees it starts to drift out of that center crosshair, it sends a command to the telescope tracker to say, hey, push it back to the center of the crosshair. And it's very, very, very sensitive. So it can detect very slight movements that our eye might not even see. Think of it as a uh, support for making sure that the tracking is correct on the uh, equatorial mount. I also have a couple of cool accessories that make this telescope system so much fun and easy to use. First, we'll go over the easy one, which is the dew heater. It's essentially just a strap that heats up the front element of the telescope to prevent dew buildup. So no moisture builds up on the lens. Easy, right? This next awesome piece of equipment is a focuser. It's an electronically assisted focuser. And the way it works is very similar to your camera phone. When you tap your camera phone to focus on a subject, it automatically brings it into focus. And that's what this electronic focuser does. It allows me to automate the focusing process to make sure my stars are tack sharp in the image and to make sure I have nice, clean, sharp images so I can get the best detail possible. And what's even cooler is it has a temperature sensor because when the temperature drops, the focus point changes. And so it's reading the ambient temperature to see if it's changing. And if it does, then it tells the system to refocus. We've gone through most of the hardware on my telescope system. So now we can talk about how I actually control all of this stuff. And I do it all through my computer. So I'm connected through a USB 3 cable that goes directly into my computer. And I use a software called Nina to actually control all of my equipment. Now there's tons of different software out there that you can use to control your equipment, but I use Nina in particular, one, because it's free, and two, it's really easy to use and intuitive in terms of astrophotography. And I will say, astrophotography software is not intuitive at all. The final thing I wanna go over is this observatory that this telescope sits in. You see, my friends and I, we got sick and tired of setting up our equipment and tearing it down night after night. And it's a pain to continually set up and realign everything and plug all the cables in. And then when you're done, you have to tear it down or put it inside or if the weather's bad or if it's raining. We just got sick and tired of having to do all of that over and over. And some of the stuff is really heavy, so that kind of adds to it as well. So we decided to pool all of our money together, build an observatory and put all of our telescope equipment there so we could just have it permanently set up. And I'll tell you, it is awesome. One of the coolest things about having this observatory set up is that I can log into my telescope remotely from home and control my telescope in the observatory. So I don't even have to be out there controlling it. Some call it lazy, but I call it progress. But Ian, what about spending time under the stars? You're taking that away. Isn't that the point of all of this? Uh, no. Now I can be anywhere in the world and still image deep space from my telescope system. And this allows me to do so many more things like travel, shoot nightscapes, go do Milky Way photography, go on workshops or adventures or catch up on my sleep. Again, progress, right? Now, taking the photos is just the first half of what it takes to get insane deep space photos. And just like a photographer, astrophotographers also need to process their images after they're taken. It's a lot of effort, a lot of work, and a lot of time. And in my opinion, it's one of the most difficult but rewarding types of photography out there. You spend weeks, months, even years honing your craft, and you spend hours and hours, night after night, getting data on that particular subject you're shooting. And it's all worth it when you finally get that end result you've been looking for. And to me, one of the most beautiful things about astrophotography is it allows access to the universe to so many more people. These views of the universe are no longer reserved to the realm of professional observatories or universities with big telescopes or NASA or governments who have the ability to create these enormous telescopes to shoot deep space. Now, that type of access to deep space is accessible to people like you and me. And I think that's the coolest thing in the world. That's it for me. I'll catch you all next time. And remember to keep looking up.